Shalom and welcome to my channel. My name is Tamar Mizels. I'm a wife and mom of three living in Israel. Today I wanted to share a little bit more about myself and answer some of your questions in this first q and I'll post timestamps for the questions down below so you can skip to questions that interest you. A lot of people ask me in videos, how do you know English so well? And do you speak English with your kids? and you switch back and forth between Hebrew and English. So I was actually born in the US. My parents moved to Israel when we were small kids. I was four years old when we moved here. So of course I learned Hebrew when we moved here and I continued to speak with my parents and my family in English, which is how I speak English. And I'm trying to do the same with my kids. Both my husband and I, we both speak English, so we try to speak to our kids in English, but like you may have seen in some of the videos that people notice that we kind of switch back and forth. Sometimes we'll be speaking English and then we'll put in a few words in Hebrew or the opposite in Hebrew, we'll say a few words in English and it's a little bit of a mishmash. So we really have to try to, when we're speaking English, speak in English and Hebrew, uh, speak in Hebrew. And we feel that they're already learning Hebrew in their school, in their kindergarten. So if we could speak to them, in English at home that will give them a little bit of an advantage. The next question is where do you live? What do you and your husband work in? So we live very close to Tel Aviv which is where we work. We first got married we looked in the area for an apartment that would be close to both of our works. We both worked in Tel Aviv area so we found an apartment. We lived there for one year and then um, once we were expecting our first kid, we moved to this apartment where we've been living in for the past eight years. And it's for both of us, it's walking distance to work. We both work in high tech, which uh, in Israel, when you say high tech, it could mean also a lot of different industries. We say high tech, it's more of a general term that we use to mean any um, company that has anything to do with marketing and tech and low tech, we usually say high tech, we mean all of these types of companies. About 10% of Israelis work in the high tech. We still don't know, you know if we're going to continue living here and for how much longer. There's a lot of other uh, aspects that have to do with it. I'm a data analyst, which means I help my company with data and understanding business insights. The next question is why I started YouTube. So no one actually asked me this on YouTube, but a lot of times in real life people ask me. Uh, my babysitter just told me that she was on YouTube and all of a sudden a video of mine popped up and she was pretty surprised. So a lot of people ask about it because it's not the most standard thing to do to have a YouTube channel. And the reason I started it was because I studied uh, industrial engineering in the Technion and I also have a master's degree in data science. And I started working as a data analyst or in data field. And as soon as I started working, I felt that something was missing. Like people are nice, but I, I couldn't pinpoint. I just felt like something was really, really missing. A lot of times people say, try thinking what you enjoy doing as a kid and maybe that could help you with your career choices. And I tried to remember and I remembered that as a, as a kid growing up, I always loved teaching. From a young age, I tutored in math, in the university I tutored, and I also always loved performing. Uh, we do, me and my sister would do little shows and Broadway shows, performances for our parents. And I was in the choir and the Technion and I, so I love singing and performing. And I also love reading and learning things. So I said, maybe I'll start a YouTube channel. If I start a YouTube channel, I can learn things and just teach whatever I'm interested in at the time. You know, I'm learning something, I'll teach it. So basically, any idea that pops into my head or anything I'm reading about and I want to teach, I just make a YouTube video about it. Since I started this channel, I have so much satisfaction. I prepare a video and someone in a different area in the world tells me that they enjoyed the video and they learned something new and it brings me so much joy. Um, so I wanted to thank you for being here and for watching my content. I really, really appreciate it and I appreciate all of your comments and it's something that I recommend people to do. Like if you're feeling that something is missing and you're not creating something, um, try to get a creative outlet. Try to do some paint work or writing or vlogging, 
something that will bring you joy in creating. I think that we're people that a lot of us need this creative outlet. YouTube channel, it's not something I'd really recommend for everyone to do because it does take a lot of time. Every video takes me about 10 to 15 hours to prepare the content, film it, edit it. It makes me also appreciate my day job more because I have my day job and then I have my creative outlet that empowers me. So I really, since I started this YouTube channel, I have so much more satisfaction. I'm not always thinking to myself, you know, something's missing. I'm always busy creating content. Every time I, I walk, I think that could be a good idea. I have a long list of ideas that I want to make videos on. So it's, it's really fun to always be thinking about, you know, the next idea, reading something, writing it down. It could be an interesting topic to research and to film about. Now, some questions that you asked me in the community tab, I asked you to ask me a few questions. So someone asked, are you Jewish Orthodox? Do you consider yourself modern Orthodox? If so, in which cities in Israel communities like this can be found? I've heard it's not a big thing in Israel, but maybe I'm wrong. Modern Orthodox basically means like it sounds. You are Orthodox, you keep to the Jewish law, but at the same time, you are part of the modern world and modern values. This is very common among American Jews and a very well-known figure that passed away in the 90s was Rav Yosef Dov Soloveitchik, who represented the modern Orthodox world. There is an Israeli version, you can say, of modern Orthodox. It's called Religious Zionism, Tzionut Datit. Religious Zionists are also modern and part of the modern world, but at the same time, there's a little bit of a difference because the religious Zionists living in Israel put more of an emphasis on Israel, which means on the army, the IDF, and uh, some also settlements and living in the land. Uh, the land of Israel is emphasized. Of course, the state of Israel and you know, the fact that we return to the land of Israel, we see this as you know, coming true. Prophecies in the Bible are coming true. So this is more of an emphasis placed on this compared to modern Orthodox living in the US where you know, they're, even if they support the state of Israel, it's less of an emphasis. The religious Zionists in Israel are sort of like a spectrum and they have a lot of different opinions um, within. I'm going to do a separate video on that, explaining the differences within this uh, religious Zionist group. But if we look at the modern Orthodox group, those who put more of an emphasis on the modern world, um, we can think of Yeshivat Har Atzion, which is a religious Zionist yeshiva. Uh, led by, used to be led by Rav Lichtenstein, who passed away in recent years. And this yeshiva is known for, you know, being sort of a little bit more liberal and modern Orthodox ideas. And they're also students of Rav Yosef Dov Soloveitchik, who is a big figure in the modern Orthodox world. So if we look at sort of modern Orthodox representatives in the religious Zionist group, we can think of this yeshiva. Which communities can this be found in? So religious Zionists are about 11% of the population. They could be found in all cities, all in settlements. But if we're looking for the modern Orthodox representatives, so we'd probably have to look in more Anglo communities like the city of Ranana or the town of Efrat, places where more people come from America and places like that they would be more leaning towards the more modern orthodox and maybe also more liberal. Someone says, I would like to know more on how feasible it is to buy an apartment in Israel for an average family with a bank loan. Could you please give some examples? Living in Jerusalem, 70 square meters, how much would I need to earn in Tel Aviv without renting but buying? Uh, okay, so this is a little bit uh, tricky and difficult buying an apartment in Israel is no easy task. And basically to buy an apartment in Israel, you'll need 25% of the apartment's price as a down payment. You need at least 25% um, on hand and the rest you can pay in payments. There are some government programs like Mechir Lamishtaken that will require less than 25%, but most apartments in Israel require at least 25%. In May 2023, an average two-bedroom apartment in Jerusalem was 2.26 million. 
shekels and a three bedroom apartment was 2.87 million shekels. This is a little bit tricky when we say in Israel a three room apartment, shalosh chadarim, what we really mean is a two bedroom apartment because we count the living room as a room. So when you say a four room apartment, what you really mean is a three bedroom. Average price in Jerusalem is about two and a half million shekel for an apartment. In Tel Aviv, this is 4.25 million. If we look at an average two bedroom apartment in Jerusalem for about two million shekels and you have 25% to pay offhand, that would mean I use the calculator for this. There's calculators that you can use online to determine what your monthly payment would be if you want to divide it in 20 years, 30 years, um, also how much of the down payment you're able to pay. So you put it in the calculator and it comes out to 10,000 shekels monthly, which is $2,800 monthly. But as an Ole, as someone who comes and moves to Israel, I know there's a lot of government benefits and things like that. So definitely look at Nefesh Benefesh. There's more information there about you know, when is the best time to buy a house if you're planning, if it's before Adalia or during, and they'll give you all the tips how to do it and let you know about benefits that there are. That now a lot of people are saying that it's not the best time to buy because the interest rate in Israel is pretty high. So maybe if you have investments in other places, you could leave it there and rent an apartment, but you said that you prefer to buy. So I definitely recommend you go be in touch with Nefesh Benefesh. I'm sure there's a lot of info uh, to learn about this as you're right as an ole. So good luck and let us know if you have any more questions. So there's a question, what is it like to live in Israel and walk on the very ground so many great people have walked? Does Israel really have this magical feeling about it? So the truth is, I think people, you kind of get used to anything and everything and the magic uh, goes away, but sometimes you're remembered by this. Like a lot of people, if they go to Jerusalem in front of the cocktail, you know, they feel the special moment or if you go on a special trip and you, uh, you kind of all of a sudden have like a special feeling, it takes these special moments to kind of wake up and realize how amazing it is to be here, something that our forefathers can only dream of and pray about for so many years and we're so lucky. So I'd say a lot of times we do, me at least, or people around me, it's something you know, we do take advantage. We don't walk around and feel so magical and special, but definitely we're reminded on occasion and it's something that we shouldn't take for granted because it really is so, so special. What are the schools like? Do you have public, private, and religious private schools? Do the public schools teach the Torah? So most students in Israel go to public school that is supervised by the state. There's secular and religious, but there is also the ultra-Orthodox go to sort of semi-private because it's not completely supervised by the state, but they are still very much funded by the state at a certain percentage. So that would be sort of uh, private. Do the public schools teach the Torah? So yes, even the secular, schools do teach uh, Bible, Tanakh, and some Torah, but they do teach it in a little bit of a different perspective. I think we'll do a video about the Israeli uh, public system and more about the different facets of this because it's uh, really interesting. Do people live in the countryside like with lots of land and neighbors far away? So most of Israelis live in the urban areas. Like you can imagine, Israel is a pretty small country with highly uh, populated, pretty dense population. But there are some people that live in more agriculture areas, like we call it kibbutzim, a kibbutz, or moshavim, moshav, where they have like a plot of land that they're in charge of. And these places, they get more of a community feeling. I have a few friends at work that live in a kibbutz and you know, high quality of life. They generally build you know, homes and not small apartments. But uh, my friends from work are commuting and it's a pretty far commute because if you want you know, a house on a kibbutz, it's usually in the peripheral areas of uh, Israel. So it's a little bit harder to get to and to commute to work. Um, you asked a few questions about the temple and you know, 
people visiting the temple grounds. I'm gonna do a full video about the temple because it is such an interesting topic uh, to learn about. What is the climate like in Israel? Cold, hot, rainy, how do you heat and cool your home? So on one hand, we're part of the Mediterranean climate. Our coast is, you know, Tel Aviv and Haifa is part of the Mediterranean, pretty warm weather. Uh, you know, hot summers and winters are also pretty warm, not so much rain or storms. But we do have a desert area in the south of Israel. There's a desert area, which means it's very cold at nights. And also summer there's are very hot. We have the Dead Sea area, which is the lowest point in the world where it can get very hot there, especially in the summers. And we have the Northern area uh, with a lot of hills and Jerusalem also has a lot of hills, which is, you know, a little bit cooler, uh, hilly area. There's some snow that some of these higher points get uh, heat and cool our home. So we really are not air conditioning people. I know that uh, some of my friends, they love sleeping with air conditioning and they love having it on all the time in summer and in winter. We really don't like it. We love opening the windows and some really hot days we'll use the air conditioning, but usually we have ceiling fans that we really, really like during the summer and winter. We don't use a few days. We use the air conditioning. We'll have a radiator in the kids room to keep them warm, but we don't use, we barely use any uh, heating during the winter. Winters here are pretty warm. What are common vacation spots in Israel? What types of things do you do there? So we said there's a few different areas. There's the desert and there's up north that's more green area and there's Jerusalem, of course. So there's a lot of vacation spots in Israel. It depends what you're looking for. We like to go, a lot of times we like to go to the Dead Sea area or we like to go up north. In August, we usually have like a family trip that we go up north and there's some really beautiful uh, streams there that we love uh, hiking in. If you were to travel outside of Israel, what other countries would Israelis choose? So Israelis, I don't have any number on this, but Israelis love to travel. They take a long trip after the army service to South America and to different areas. And friends might even tell me about you know, distant areas in India and Thailand where they speak Hebrew and they have Hebrew signs and Israelis really, really love traveling. A lot of them travel to India, Thailand is a really big destination, uh, US, Europe. Uh, do you have a favorite vacation spot in Israel? Have you ever been to the USA? So like I said, we like to travel a lot uh, up north in August. We have a family trip. And I also like the Dead Sea area. We travel there sometimes. And yet, like I said, I, I lived in the USA till age four. And then uh, we would visit a lot in the summer vacation. We would visit my grandparents. Uh, in the past few years, uh, since my grandparents passed away, we don't visit as much. I did have a honeymoon trip there with my husband in 2015, right after we were married. So, I haven't been back since, so it's about eight years. If you have any more questions for me, please comment below. And thank you so much for being here. Hope to see you in the next video. See you next time.